I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internets where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about building OS X applications with JavaScript, fixed headers, and more. Let's check it out. First up, we have a very thorough blog post from Tyler Gaw on building OS X applications with JavaScript. In OS X Yosemite, JavaScript is now a first-class citizen for building native OS X applications. Now, uh, OS X Yosemite can be used with JavaScript very, very simply. Uh, first, going through and creating an Objective-C application, just say import Coco, and boom, you are done. That's it. Your application is now completely built in JavaScript. No, I'm just kidding. There is a whole example application that he goes through and creates using JavaScript. Uh, this is just a very simple and uh, very nice looking image selector and displayer. He just grabs an image and then displays it right there inside of this native OS X application, and this is done entirely in JavaScript. So like I said, very thorough walkthrough, go through, create the application, specify how it needs to run, and then, like I said, this is extremely thorough. It's a really long application. Like I'm just holding the space bar and scrolling through really long, but it's actually really great. Go ahead, read it, follow along, and then you can write OS X applications in JavaScript. Link in the show notes. Too long to summarize. That is wonderful. Well, next up is CSS style or CS style. No, I think it's just style because the two minuses means you don't say the C and the S. Oh, OK. That makes more sense now. So anyway, this is a modern approach for crafting beautifully maintainable style sheets. Basically, it's a collection of SAS mixins that make your CSS readable and semantic. So what does that mean? Well, this is kind of an interesting project. And frankly, I'm not sure how I feel about it just yet. I haven't tried it myself in a large project. But let me know what you think along the way. So basically, I there's. I think it's pretty neat. You, you think it's pretty neat? I think that's just what the, the button says right there. Uh, basically. We have this button here, right? And there's a there's a class called button. And you can include this component, which is what CSS style organizes things into, these reusable components. And you would pass it button. So so far, pretty basic stuff. It's actually very similar to any other SAS mixin. However, you can also pass these components options. So here we have this option called action. And this would basically specify some styling that would say, OK, this is a button, but it's an action button. And so we want to have sort of this different color for it. And you would have a button, and then you would have these options that are passed as arguments, just like that. And then there's also parts. So here's yet another. Uh, thing building on top of components, they're composed of parts. And these are child elements of the component that can be styled. And so you end up with some syntax like this. So you have a button, but inside of that button, you also have an icon. And that icon can be changed out using another one of those options. And you end up with something like this. So we have a button. But then we also have an icon inside of that. And then we specify what icon we want. And we do that using options. There's also a couple of other things here. This is kind of neat locations. You can basically specify, you know, I only want these styles in a particular part of my site. A lot of cool stuff here. I personally feel like this is maybe getting into territory where you might actually be overcomplicating your CSS in certain ways that it doesn't need to be, or just including a lot of stuff into the markup that maybe could have just been bundled into one class or something like that. Anyway, it's a little hard to say if this is actually going to be very useful or if it will lead you to a place that's very difficult to maintain. Hard to tell. But uh, 
Yeah, anyway. You use it in your project and let us know how it works. Yeah, yeah. This would be a great thing to discuss in the forum. Yeah. Maybe figure out uh, what you think. Go, go ahead and check it out. Let us know. Mm -hmm. Next up, we have a really interesting project called Julius JS. This is speech recognition for the web. So it uses the Julius speech recognition engine. This is a full, part, uh, full port to JavaScript. Let's go ahead and try the live demo. I'm going to allow this website access to my microphone. And we'll say, you're watching The Treehouse Show with Nick Pettit and Jason Seifer. And then it says dial 2380020428206274. And then when you dial that phone number, you'll hear what Jason just said in a recording. One, two, three, four, five, six. See, it got the numbers perfect. Hmm. Look, it says the vocabulary is limited for this demo. Oh, okay. We probably should have read the instructions before we started. I guess. Who who knows? Who knows uh, what the reasoning is? Anyway, this is actually really simple to use. Uh, just instantiate a new Julius element. Uh, I'm sorry, object on your page, and then it gives you this event right here on recognition. Pass in the sentence or the words that were recognized, and then you can manipulate that. Console.log here is just going to log the sentence that was heard to the console. Now this is transcribed in real time. You can use the provided grammar or write your own, and this is 100% done in JavaScript. And this is really interesting because it uses background workers. So um, simple to use. Uh, you can get started really quickly using Express 4.0. Uh, just install it with Bower and include Julius.js on your page. Require it, and then you are good to go. Now, this is still maybe a little bit early to use in production, but very, very interesting to see what's going on and kind of get a sneak peek at the future today. Wow, tomorrow is today. Well, next up is Midnight JS. Is, is that your Halloween costume? Nope. It's a project that allows you to switch fixed headers on the fly. So if I scroll down here, Whoa, look what? at that. The header is just sort of changing on the fly as I scroll down the page. How is that happening? Well, Midnight.js tells you to specify your normal fixed navigation. So you have navigation or your header kind of fixed at a particular point. Usually that would be closer to the top of the page, but for the purposes of the Midnight.js example, they kind of have it towards the middle because that is the focus here. Then you have different sections of your website, right? So you have maybe a section, maybe a div, maybe a footer, however you are organizing your site. And then you give it a data attribute. So you say data midnight. So you're not using a CSS class here, right? And you tell it, I want this part to be white. I want this part to be blue, kind of like that. And then you can use those as actual CSS classes. So slightly different things there. You specify the data attribute. You tell it where your class is the class you are going to use to style that header, right? So this needs to be reflected in your CSS, even though it's not an actual class. So here, you style your headers, right? And you say, I want the background to be none on this particular section, and then I want it to be black, and then I want the background to be white and the color to be black, the background to be blue, the color white, and so on. And as you scroll down the page, it will change colors. Now, this is, of course, a jQuery plugin. So you just go ahead and load jQuery, then you load midnight, and then you call it on your fixed navigation. So you just select your fixed navigation there, and then you call the midnight function. Anyway, pretty simple to use. Of course, there's a couple of ways that you can customize it with options, as uh, is the case with most jQuery plugins that we talk about here on the show. And you can download it right there, or you can get it on GitHub. Pretty cool stuff. Yeah, very nice. Uh, next up, we have a blog post called Five Array Methods That You Should Be Using Now. 
Uh, and when they say now, they mean like kind of, you know, in this day and age, it's okay to be using these array methods, not stop what you're doing and like, just call these in the browser. Like maybe after you've read the article. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah, because you won't know them until you read it. Right. Uh, but did you know that when the ECMAScript 5 was published in December of 2009, it brought with it array methods that improved existing array methods, but this did not really catch on because it's only been relatively recently that all of the modern browsers supported these array additions or extras. So this is a blog post that kind of summarizes five that you should be using. Here's an example of index of, which will check for any occurrence of an item in an array. Without this method, you had to pretty much create a for loop and another variable called found. And then if it was found in the array, you could log that. But with index of, you can just call the method index of and specify whether or not it is equal to negative one, zero, or one depending on whether or not it was found in the array. The filter method will let you find all of the items in an array that pass a certain test. So in this example, we have an array of objects with names and counts. And using the filter method, instead of, again, doing a for loop and creating a new array, we can do this all in one statement. We'll just say filter with this particular condition and the new array will contain that. There's also the for each method, which will iterate over different items using the index. So here we have an array. Using a for loop, we could start from zero, count all the way up to the array's length, and then increment the iterator and log it. Or we could use the for each method to pass the item in and the position inside of the array, and then just log it that way. Now, there are a couple different items in here, map and reduce, which you may be familiar with from programming languages like Ruby or even extension libraries that you've used to make writing uh, or, and working with arrays either, easier. For example, underscore.js has this functionality. Um, so anyway, thorough blog post. Check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes. Hopefully, it's taught you something that you can actually begin using now. Very cool stuff. Now that we've gone over it. Well, that's all we have time for this week. I'm at NickRP on Twitter. And I am at Jay Cipher. For more information on what we talked about, check out the show notes below the video and feel free to discuss it in the forum. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs> oh, boy.